yeah, we just saw uh, computers are great, but uh, they could be so much greater. And this is what I'm going to talk about. I want to show you that we need a, a broader understanding towards computers and that we need to understand more to make technology more like for us humans than we have to change to adopt technology. But uh, before that, I would like to have a look at the history. I want to show to you that we need to understand to give tools to people so that innovation can happen. The, the problem with the technology, I think, the mouse has been around for many years, and it's very hard to actually design hardware. And I think we need to prepare tools so that creative people, designers, artists, exhibition makers, are able to deal with hardware to make better computers. And for this, I'd like to have a look into history. We see here one of the first works done with desktop publishing. Desktop publishing really changed the world as we knew it before. It was very difficult prior to the introduction of desktop publishing to actually prepare a printed uh, result because you needed a typography expert to take care of your typography. You needed somebody to prepare the images. You also needed somebody to prepare all the stuff for the printer and then you needed some expert to print the stuff. So there were a lot of experts the creative person had to deal with. And these experts had their tradition, they had their price, which made things expensive, they had their own tradition of rules. So we have never done it this way, so we won't do it now. Um, and they made things, and also there was always a problem of communication. So how do I explain an expert what to do? And since desktop publishing reached the world, we saw actually an explosion in visual culture and in visual language. So I think through the introduction of tools which are accessible to a lot of people, we see innovation happening. Actually, the Internet did it right from the beginning. There we have in every browser, we have a little uh, feature called View Source. I, may, I hope uh, most of you have seen it. And with this button, you can actually see the source code of the web page. So the technology of the Internet was accessible directly to everyone, and you could take the source code, try to understand it, take it for your own website, and prepare and change it, adapt it, learn the internet. Actually, a lot of people who, who became web designer or who, who are still doing this are using this, this method of learning how to do stuff. So, and what, what is the result? We saw a huge wave of innovation going through the internet. And we see a lot of people starting their own things and making their own website. Of course, we also see a lot of horrible things, but I'm not, I, I'm not scared of the horrible things. I'm rather scared if innovation is not really happening. And so that's a little bit our attempt to go into the direction of hardware and offer a way to uh, allow lots of people to be innovative there. But let's go back to the question, why do we want to do that? And I think Fabian gave me a good start up. I would like to talk with you about how our bodies matter. That's actually a drawing from my friend Tom Igo. That's how computers see us. So we are this poor creature, <laughs> one finger on the touchpad or on the keys, one eye. I'm happy that this image is actually blurred because it's also not very rich in, in, in what we see and two little ears. And that's something definitely we would like to change. We need to get the technology more to become as we are so that we can use it. So I'd like to share six points with you how bodies matter in, in the way we use technology in our daily lives. The first is the perception. Our perception is really rich. We perceive, uh, Fabian said it, we perceive a lot through smell. We, we perceive a lot of things on the periphery of our perception. The cocktail party phenomenon, where even it's loud, we talk to our friends, uh, music is playing, we can still hear if people start talking about us, some groups behind us. The computer doesn't take advantage of this richness of perception we have. We have to be focused on what we are doing, and there's no other choice than being focused on using the computer. So now, researchers all over the world are looking into new ways of ambient information, which are not as, as the model today, but which are at the periphery of our perception. One project our, of our lab, for example, is a, a credit card reader, because digital money also kind of disappears in their, in their physical value. A credit card reader where you can swipe your card through and it becomes harder and harder the, more, the higher the amount it is. So you get an ambient feedback, as we call it. 
The next one is the expression we are able to have with our bodies. I'm, tr uh, I'm trained stonemason be before I became a designer, and I really, uh, I'm re really grateful for this experience of seeing with strength how, how, how wonderful things can be done by using force. But at the same time, I'm also impressed that violinists with really minimal change of, of physical force can create sounds and, and a, whole, uh, a whole atmosphere. And I'm wondering why the computers are always on the same level of force. And not only it makes us un unhealthy, as we all know, those of us who have been using computers long enough, but also it's, it's not taking advantage of the richness we have as humans. So one nice example we did there in my lab was a phone which you would like to slap. So if it starts ringing, for example, in an audience like here, you could just slap it out, for example. And I'm wondering, we need more of these, looking at these other areas of, uh, of how to integrate technology in our daily life. The next one is motor memory. A lot of uh, things we are really impressed uh, uh, from, for example, the mastership in piano or, or in violin come because we have the ability of storing complex movements into our brain and recalling it on a very robust level without, uh, without using our consciousness. And I mean, the, the, the question here is definitely, imagine you would have to ride a bicycle through drop-down menus and uh, using a mouse. That would be really hard. And I think... <laughs> And I think there's a lot of potential in storing this information, like for example, car driving, really a complex task in storing this information into our body, and we are not taking advantage of this at all. I mean, I have been using Photoshop for, well, enough years, and I still have to go through the entire same process as a, as a beginner, so there is no advantage. We have a little motor memory when we use uh, up to uh, control Z and control V and control C, but that's it. And I think there is more potential to be for, for that feature. It goes even further. I mean, the way we, we use tools, they become really extensions of our body. We actually feel the street through the bicycle. We don't think that this is translated somehow, but the computer does not allow anything similar to that. So besides perception and action or expression, our thinking is also a little bit uh, reduced through the way we use computers today. Uh, there's a lot of research going on on how uh, we mentally work, and one, one famous uh, study was looking at uh, Scrabble, people who, are allowed, uh, people who are allowed to use their hand while forming words in Scrabble get a third more results than those who just look at, 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 the, at, the, at the letters. And it even goes further. Uh, gestures are enormously important for us to formulate our thoughts. Even blind kids are using gestures, and there are research showing that formulating, for example, geographical situations is really hard to do it without gestures. But what do we do? We put the people in the back of the computer eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day without moving. The only movement they have is maybe a cigarette break. And I'm not sure that that's the way we humans want to continue working in this area. So there's a whole movement going on now with developing modular computers, which are as big as a Scrabble brick or a little bigger, and which are used to make music, to bring things together, to do architecture, for example. And I'm really excited. We did a very nice one, uh, Fox in the Box, uh, where we used it for making music. And what is nice with these bricks, they are already so social. So the moment you, sh you use bricks to make music, you have a second person joining in, etc. Another aspect of computers, which I'm missing a lot, the visibility. Uh, I mean, I have small kids. I sit behind my black uh, little notebook, and I mean, what do they think? What is dad doing all day? I mean, there's no link to, no, no, no visible hint of what I'm doing. And interestingly enough, in an area where technology, where high tech is always been very early adoption, where they have lots of money to research new tools, uh, in air traffic control, it's an old image, but it's still like this. In air traffic control, each single airplane is a stripe of paper which is taken from the air traffic controller, and then he can take notes, as we see here. He, uh, the others see how many everybody has. If there is, for example, one guy has too many, the colleague can go and say, do you need my help? He can give it to somebody, a very old gesture we have uh, uh, to take the responsibility of these. 
And, and, and these are a lot of things which we don't use at all in computers and where I think we, as, as mankind, need to find solutions to have a better way of using computers. And the visibility doesn't stop in, in this uh, work-related context. It's also interesting we learn through looking at people. Vittorio Galese is a researcher who, who, in, who discovered the mirror neur neurons, which are, uh, well, he, the story goes like this. He was sitting with an ape in the cage, and the ape was used for brain research. So they found out the areas of the brain of the ape where he, which are active when he's moving a, a hand, for example, to eat a nut. So then it was, the device was making these noises, and they knew, okay, this brain is active. And then Vittorio took, him, uh, took an, a nut himself and ate it, and the same areas of the brain of this ape became active. So, so the theory goes like this. By watching people, the same areas of our brains are active Then we would, then if we would do the, the action ourselves. And only later we decide whether we are actually executing the action or not. So when we yawn, for example, uh, we are not having this control, but, uh, but mostly we have. And actually they even found out that uh, by watching sports you uh, increase your muscles. Only very little, <laughs> but at least. And so that's why we need also a way of making work with computers or with technology more visible, because that's the way we have been learning uh, th throughout uh, mankind, and I think we should not give up this way of learning. So, and last but not least, least I would like to mention that the computer creates an environment of no risk. We always can do undo stuff. We always have another website we can go to, another chat room we can work with, and there is no risk. And the thing, uh, this is more philosophical approach, but philosophers say that their risk and attention are very closely intervened, and it's really poor that we may, that we create this completely riskless environment where we are in, and we should look closer into this to to create better awareness and better concentration through increasing the risk. There is only artwork which is actually dealing with this. There is this very famous uh, 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 pain station. It's a, it's a computer game where you actually get hit on your hand with a little whip each time you make a mistake. I'm not saying that we should put this one-to-one -one into a word or something, but I think we should definitely get a better feeling on what risk means in this digital environment. So I hope I could show you a couple of ideas why our bodies and the way we are matter and why we need to create a new culture of interfaces and of interaction with the computer. But why has been there so little there? And that's why what I showed you prior with the desktop publishing, it's really hard to design hardware. It's really expensive. It's really a little bit like a secret society. To, it's, uh, these, these people are, are creating a world where where it's impossible for normal people to get into. And that's changing right now as we speak. There is a whole creative community in Italy, in California, but all over the world, Scandinavia, who are now creating tools so that designers and artists and actually everyone can start dealing with hardware, building their own hardware ideas, making sketches out of it, sharing the knowledge. And we are having a little... Uh, uh, a little job in this, we developed a software called Fritzing, and it's a big team of people from, from all over the world. And with this software, we allow people not only to document and to share the knowledge they have or to use other people's knowledge, because that's the way you learn. You see something interesting and you want to you want to improve it, you want to adapt it for your own needs, and that's also how innovation is happening. And so far, electronics has always been this black box. But with our software, we allow people to document little ideas they had, to put them online, to discuss them, to get professional help, and finally even to produce them on mass production levels, which is really when we started this project, we had a couple of engineers supporting us, the friends of Fritzing, as they are called, and uh, they said that would be impossible. You need to be an engineer to, have, to be able to, to use professional technologies. And I'm very happy to be able to show you. So that's the culture of people dealing with uh, hardware, building interesting things. Actually, 
The prototypes we saw by Fabian, Fabian are also technically, they are not really, really exciting. It's a little motor moving up and down. The idea is there, which is so strong. And I think we have to give more tools to people to have strong ideas and not to have to be blocked by the technology they need to deal with. And so with our software, they can look up existing circuits, they can copy them, they can, uh, uh, you, they can copy their own circuits, make them digital so that they can share them. They can use the secret language of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the go, of the priest of hardware, of the electronical engineers. So that's the way they, these people communicate. And finally, they're even able to, to put it online, to share it with other people, to take other people's invention and, and re reuse it for their own need, and finally to produce a PCB. And I'm very proud because that's only happened this week that we are able to produce uh, PCBs in a professional environment. So now we have a data format getting out so you can send them to China and produce one million of it, or you can go to some German expensive PCB manufacturer, Platine, and produce one or two of this. But that's a big step. And I, and I really hope that with this uh, technology and with this, also the approach of open source, open source sharing the project, people are contributing to the software, people are contributing to the knowledge which is there, uh, that we, with this approach, will see a really a, a new wave of innovation in the way the computers are and in the way computers are integrated our daily lives. So that was my little message I had to tell you today. Thank you very much.